happy to see you here, have you here. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 12 is where we'll start as we are continuing through the book of Luke, looking at the life of Jesus Christ. And um, as a Christian, that word Christian means Christ-like. And uh, my desire, my goal, my mission ought to be to be like him. And uh, I hope that is yours as well. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. Tell you what, if you're able, could you stand for me with the, for the reading of God's Word? Now, if you have a physical ailment or whatever, you can stay seated, and I'll not be offended at all. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse number 12. We're going to read um, up through verse number uh, 26. Verse number 12, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seen Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest. And offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them and behold men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus when he saw their faith, he said, said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed unto his house, glorifying God. They were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Now, Lord, thank you so much. For your word. Lord, as we look into your word today, I ask you to help us to submit ourselves to your word and to your Holy Spirit. Lord, each of us in here, we, we may need something a little different from you or from each other. So Lord, I pray that you would give each of us that which we need, whether it's encouragement or strength or, or a rebuking or a whooping. Lord, I pray that you would draw us closer to you today and help us leave here, Lord, not just stirred but changed. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Here in Luke chapter 5, this passage, we see the power of Jesus to change a life. And boy, there is power in Jesus Christ to change a life, isn't there? Uh, the power of Jesus can change an individual. The power of Jesus can change a home. The power of Jesus can can change a church, the power of Jesus can change an entire nation, the power of Christ can change an entire world. The key to it, though, is we've got to yield to Him, we've got to obey. Uh, if we live in disobedience and in rebellion to Him, we're just tying His hands. And He will not be able to work in us and through us if we're not yielded and submitted to Him. Jesus, He is sovereign. He's the all-knowing Lord who intervenes in lives and shows himself mighty in their lives. There were men that, right here, that reached out to Jesus in faith. And after they reached out to Christ in faith,
They left the choice and the initiative for action to Jesus, and they recognized Him as Lord. In Psalm 34, 18, the Word of God says this, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And in this passage we're about to look at here, we see the word Lord used for Jesus in, in a deity type of way for the second time. Peter used it the first time. But we see him here, this, this leprosy, this man full of leprosy come approach him, and he calls him Lord. That word Lord here, it means he to whom a person or things belongs, about which he has power of deciding. It means master the owner, one who has control. It's given, that title is given to God, it's given to the Messiah. And as I said, this is the second time in this book we see uh, uh, the word Lord used in that way as being applied to Jesus. The first time was in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, the passage we looked at last week. When Jesus tells them to launch out and he casts their nets in the, in the water and to pull up their nets and boy they pulled up so many fish that the nets were about to break and the boats were about to sink and when Peter sees this he falls down at Jesus knees and he said depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord and when he said made that declaration and and addressed Jesus as O Lord he was acknowledging the power and the authority of Jesus Christ he was acknowledging, boy, Lord, we were out here fishing all night. We didn't take a thing in fishing. You told us to come out here and launch our nets out. We let down one net. We brought up so many fish at your word, Lord, that the nets almost broke. We had to get help from another boat. Both boats were about to sink. Lord, you are the one with all authority. You have power over very creation itself. How many of you believe that Jesus is Lord? Say amen. Now, if he is Lord and he is really in control of all things and, and he is my owner, he is my master, and what a good master he is, if he is my Lord, then why do we spend so much time worrying and fretting? Well, I've got to go to the doctor. I'm worried about what he might say. Well, wait a minute. We just said Jesus is Lord. And you know what? If Jesus is Lord and I'm going to the doctor and there's going to be some bad news given, then I had to cross the Lord's table first and he had to approve that first. And man, if there's going to be bad news given, there is a good purpose for that bad news because Jesus is Lord, isn't he? Boy, what comfort there is in that. What security there is in that. What confidence there is in that knowing that Jesus Christ my Savior, my God, my Lord, my Master He is Lord He was acknowledging that Christ had power over very creation it wasn't the last time he would see that power displayed as Peter addressed him there in Luke chapter 5 verse 8 he would see that power displayed in the healing of diseases, the blind receiving their sight, the deaf receiving their hearing, the lame receiving their ability to walk, the, the dead being brought back to life. He would see it once again when they're on the boat and, and the storm comes upon them and boy, the winds and the waves are rocking that boat and they're taking on water and they go and wake up Jesus and say, Lord, do you not care we're about to die? Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith. And he steps up on the deck of that boat and he looks out to that rough sea and, and, and the wind uh, 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 just a-blowing and he raises his hands and he says, peace, be still. Boy, Peter gets to see that power once again. He, he sees that power in the walking of the wa on the water. He sees that power in the turning of water to wine. He sees that power as Jesus multiplies just a handful of food to feed 5,000 plus term Lord is the most used term to refer to Jesus in the New Testament. Savior is used around 25 times, and boy, what a wonderful Savior He is, isn't He? Hey, how many of you on your way to heaven because you know you've trusted Christ as your Savior? Say amen. Amen. Hey, boy, isn't that good? 
Is that, why y'all look so sad about it? Yeah, he's my Savior. My goodness. I have a Savior. Savior is used around 25 times. The word Lord is used over 100 times in referring to Jesus. For Jesus, now listen, Jesus is Lord. But he desires to be Lord in your life. He, he desires to be given that place of authority in your life. And, and we say, oh, yeah, oh, I, I'm just following Jesus a, until it's inconvenient. Well, I'm following Jesus until the Word of God says something that I'm wanting to do contrary to it, then I'm going to do my thing. How many of you heard some, ever heard someone say, well, I know what the Bible says on this, but? You ever heard that? Listen, there are no buts. about. No, this is what the Word of God says. And though He is Lord, He is over all. He says, I want you to voluntarily give me that place in your life. I want you to allow me to be your Lord. Allow me to be your Master. Allow me to be in control. Because I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of peace. He says, man, I've got a plan for you. Well, I know the road you're going to go down, and I know what's at the end of that road if you'll let me lead you down it. One person said this, listen to this, Jesus cannot be separated from his teaching. Aristotle said to his disciples, follow my teachings. Socrates likewise said to his disciples, follow my teachings. Buddha said to his disciples, follow my meditations. Confucius said to his disciples, follow my sayings. And Muhammad said to his disciples, follow my noble pillars. But Jesus says to his disciples, follow me. In all the religions and philosophies of the world, a follower can follow the teachings of its founder without having a relationship with that founder. But not so with Jesus Christ. The teachings of Jesus cannot be separated from Jesus himself Christ is still alive, and he embodies his teaching. This is what separates him from every great teacher and moral philosopher in history. Jesus didn't say, follow my teachings. He said, hey, follow me. And you cannot separate one from the other. It baffles me sometimes, and I've stopped even trying to figure it out because I just don't know if I can ever understand it. I don't know if I want to understand how we sometimes can say, oh, I love Christ. And then willingly, knowingly, and even planning it out, do things that we know break the heart of Christ. How many of you in here have children? How many of you, you love your children? I, I think there were less hands just went up. I, uh, some of you were kind of, oh, well, let's see, today, I don't know about yesterday. I love children. I love them more than life. There's nothing I would intentionally do to harm my children. There have been times I've had to harm their feelings because I love them. And even in doing that, I try to teach them, look, that this punishment is not because I, 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 not even because I'm upset with you. I don't punish them because I'm upset with them. I punish them because they've done wrong. It's because I love you. It will say, I love Jesus, but. This is what the Bible says, but. This is what makes me happy. I found that when I truly love somebody, what makes me happy is not what makes me happy, it's what makes them happy. Fellas, let me, let me give you a little bit of marriage advice now that I've been married 25 years. And I heard a preacher say this a long time ago. When mama bear's happy, everybody's happy. When mama bear's not happy, then none of God's children happy. I found that I am at my happiest and I'm full of the most joy in, in my marriage when I'm yielded to Christ and when I'm living for her in the marriage. 
And I found that our marriage is even that much more wonderful, that much more blessed when she is living for Christ and living for me in that marriage. See, love is all about that other person, not about self. Yet there's those that will say, well, I love Christ, but I know what the Bible says, but I'm going to do this regardless because this is what makes me happy. Listen, to the child of God, what makes us the most satisfied is living a life in complete surrender to our Savior. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, there are some that will not let him be Lord, but one day every knee is going to bow, and one day every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, he is Lord, but have you given him that position in your everyday life? We seem all too often to make our decisions based on what we believe will make us happy without giving much thought, if any, about how our Savior would feel about it. We justify that a loving God would want us to be happy without acknowledging that He would rather us be obedient and allow Him to be our happiness. One man said this, The very word authority has within it the word author. An author is someone who creates and possesses a particular work. Insofar as God is the foundation of all authority, He exercises that foundation because He is the author and owner of His creation. Just the very fact that God is my author, God is my creator, gives Him the right to exercise His authority in my life. And yet this loving father, he says, I'm going to give you a choice, Ronnie Wise, and I'm going to choose. You can allow me to be that authority or you can be your own authority if that's what you really want. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, Paul says this to the Corinthian church. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of, of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which ye have of God? And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Do you hear what Paul's saying? These Corinthian Christians, they're, they're doing their own thing. And he said, what? what? How many of you ever had to say that to one of your kids? They, they do something, you say, what? What? What were you thinking? How many of you ever had that response? I what? You ever had that? That's a big one in my house. I wasn't thinking. And Paul says, what? what? What are you doing? Do you not realize that you've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ? We sang about the blood this morning. He says, you're not your own anymore. You belong to God. And this, this first man here, this leprous man, he comes to Jesus Christ and he acknowledges him as Lord. Now let's look here at verses 12 through 15. <clears throat> at this leper man. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. This man full of leprosy. He wasn't just a man that had leprosy and you could see it on the end of his nose or on one of his fingers. His body was filled with this loathsome disease. He was a mass of decay and corruption, dying little by little every day, having to go about with, with face covered, shouting out as he got near people, unclean, unclean, having to be kept at a distance from the rest of humanity, unable to associate with family or friends. 
And look in verse 12 there. I want you to notice his cry as this man that's just a, a walking mass of decay and corruption who, who cannot fit into society normally anymore. This man, this man with a, a he comes and he says, <clears throat> If thou wilt. There's a difference here. The man with the lunatic son came to Jesus with mixed emotions. He came to Jesus and he said, If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That man with the lunatic son came to Jesus and said, Lord, if, if, if you could, Lord, if you're able, would you have mercy on us? Would you do something? Jesus says to that man, If thou canst believe, all things are possible. And that dad, thinking of his son there, he says, I've tried everything else. And he calls to Jesus. He says, Lord, I believe help my unbelief Lord I, I believe I, I, I think you can I have just enough faith to come to you I don't know that you, you will heal him I, I really don't know that you can I just know that I'm at my wits end I've, I've done everything I know for my boy and, and you're my last hope and I've, I've heard the, the things you've done for others Lord if you can if it's all true would you do this for me but the cry of the leper was different Verse number 12, look what he says. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He was not saying, Lord, if you can. He was saying, when he said, Lord, he acknowledged, I know you're able. I don't know what brought this man to this realization, but his words are pretty clear here. Lord, he says, Master, God ruler, the sovereign one, I know you can, but will you? There was a Jewish proverb that says, God sends the leprosy so God alone can heal it. In other words, they, leprosy was seen as a, a plague of judgment, and that if God sent that, only God could heal the person from it. And he was saying, Lord, I'm acknowledging who you are. I know, I know you have the power. I know you have the power. Will you cleanse me? I want you to notice the response in verse number 13. It seems that there was no hesitation here, no pause in between. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. I will be thou clean, no hesitation. But the thing I want you to notice here is he touched him. Man, this was a man of leprosy. This is the man who would cover his face and shout unclean. This is the man, as if he got near uh, the shopkeepers, they would take their poles and, and push him away. This was the one that nobody could be around. Nobody wanted to be around. Nobody wanted to touch this man that was full of leprosy. To touch him in the minds of the Jews, by touching the leper, Jesus would be defiling himself. He was breaking the the laws of uh, the ceremonial laws of cleanliness and yet Jesus he broke the ceremonial law and demand of a higher law he touched the leper and he cleansed him of his disease so in compassion he took our sins in his own body what a picture of salvation we were lost in our sins we were defiled filth at our best the Bible says that all of our righteousnesses all the good that we can do at our very best it was just a filthy rag and yet the son of God he chose to come to this earth and, and take the form of a human body and, and live for 33 years on this earth and, and then to hang on a cross and, and to take our sins in his own body he came to the Filth of this world. He touched him. What compassion. What love. Someone said this none is beyond the reach of the love that could bid away at once and forever that leprosy. No cry can escape the ear of a love that has the answering, I will, ready for the praying, if thou wilt. We have a high priest who has been touched with our sin in its exceeding sinfulness. Forever and ever there stands the pledge of the world's healer. I will 
be thou clean. And to the worst of sinners, to the one who, who seems by the world standards to be the lowest of the low, if he'll just simply call out, Lord, if you will, he says, I will. Listen, let me ask you, let me take a little side trail here. You know, our, our, our goal, our theme this year, in his image, trying to become like Christ. Let us examine ourselves and ask ourselves, do we have that same kind of compassion? That same kind of compassion where and whatever sin they may have been involved in, we're still willing and still have the compassion to touch them with Jesus Christ. Or do we say, oh, oh, any sin but that one? I've not always had that attitude, and I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest. I, I, I don't know if it's completely there. I'm sure it's not like it needs to be. I'm not in his image yet. I'm trying, man, I'm trying to yield myself to him and, and let him produce his image in me. But I remember as a college student, went out soul winning, telling people about Christ. Don't want people to go to hell. We shouldn't want people to go to hell. And I remember it was me, we were at Seville Square in Pensacola, Florida. There weren't many people out that night in that downtown area. Me and my partner here were walking. We're finding people that we can, handing out gospel tracts, trying to tell them about Christ. And all of a sudden, a few blocks down, I noticed, man, there, it's happening down there. There's a lot of people down there. Let's go down there. So we began to walk down the street. You get on this corner, and I mean, it's about dead as, as all can be back here, but over there, it is on. Oh, man, there's some people right there. Let's go tell them about Christ. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? As we got about to the middle of the street, I noticed something funny here. I see a lot of couples, but it's not man and woman couples. There's men and men. Men and men, some holding hands. I realized all of a sudden we had walked up in an event that was less than palatable to me. I don't know if it was a homosexual bar or what it was, but I stopped in the middle of the road and I said, Hold, hey, did you see what I see? He said, yeah, I did. That, that, that's, that's homosexuals right there. I said, I know. I said, I'm ashamed of this. I said, somebody else is going to have to tell these people. Now listen, it probably wouldn't have been the wisest thing to walk right up into the middle of it all, okay? Because they may have gotten militant or something, I, I don't know. Let me tell you something. I'm no better than they are. I was just a sinner, but by the grace of God, he saved my soul. And to look at them and say, no, I can't tell them how wicked and out of sin they are. That would have been like Jesus saying, oh, there's a man with, oh, leprosy? Ah. Do you know Jesus didn't have to touch him to heal him? He didn't have to. One man had a daughter sick at home. He said, uh, okay, she's healed. You can go back home. But Jesus, he showed us something when he reached out and this man that nobody else would touch, he touched him. And the worst of sins, Jesus' love, Jesus' blood, Jesus' grace, and Jesus' mercy, he reaches beyond the deepest, worst, most heinous sins and says, listen, I will cleanse you. I'll save you if you let me. Are we in his image? Preacher, do you approve of homosexuality? No, it's a, it's a sin. It is a sin. The Bible says it's a sin. Just like you gossip. It's a sin, right? I mean, it's a sin. Just like, well, I, how about this one? This is listed in some pretty stout lists here. How about our pride? That's a sin too, isn't it? Yeah, only one person says amen. The rest are like, I don't, I don't even want to answer that, preacher. You know. He 
reaches out and he touches him. We see next, we see the lame man in verses 16 through 26. And by the way, saying something is a sin does not make us hate it. It makes us that much more a lover of the person to declare the truth. To declare the truth. Look, if you see a scorpion on the back of my head about to sting me, it will not offend me if you walk up and smack the snot out of me if it'll get the scorpion off of there. Now, don't come do that and say, I thought I saw a scorpion, preacher. If you care enough about me to let me know the truth, hey, I know you care. Verse 16 through 26, we see the lame man, Jesus, now he's gone to this house and he's in this house teaching and in this house there were Pharisees and there were doctors of the law. I want you to notice the comment too. The Bible said the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Anybody that had a need, the power of the Lord was there. It always is when Jesus is around. It was there to heal them, whoever needed it. The same power was there to heal those doctors of the law and those Pharisees as it was to heal anybody else. But they weren't there to hear they weren't there to be healed. They weren't there to get help. They were there as spectators, critics, censors, watching and uh, for grounds of reproach and accusation. Boy, and isn't that distilled the problem today we see with many of us? Matthew 5, 8, we see Jesus. He says, this people draweth nigh unto me, as he's quoting from Isaiah, with their mouth and, their, uh, uh, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Here's these Pharisees. I mean, they have their acts together, but they're, they're missing something. Missing Christ. And they come to sit down there. They're listening. They're not there for help. They're there to criticize and find some fault. The power to heal is still there, and many are, just, uh, are still just sitting as spectators watching and criticizing. Don't we do that? We'll come to church. Boy, did you hear what the preacher said this time? There's no telling what the preacher said. Did you hear? Boy, he quoted that verse wrong. Well, that, I, that's not the first time I've told people uh, all kinds of things wrong, just misquote stuff. Instead of saying, boy, hey, we read this one verse, and boy, that verse got a hold of me. Our families fall apart while we sit by and criticize everything going on around us. Our children will go astray while we just sit by. When the Lord is there saying, hey, I'll help you. I'll help you with your family. I'll help you with your children. I'll help you with those circumstances. I'll help you with those battles you're facing right there. I'll help you if you'll just let me. We just sit by. Our nation turns from the Lord. Oh, we just sit by. Our friends and family die and enter a Christless hell for eternity. Oh, we just sit by. Generation grows up without the Lord while we just sit by. No doubt those doctors of the law, no doubt those Pharisees, they must have known somebody that needed some healing, that needed some help. And here they are. They're actually in the house. They're in the presence of the one who can heal them, but they're just sitting by. Oh, but there's a man taken with the palsy. He's a lame man. He, his four friends, they gather him. They lay him on a bed like a stretcher, and they carry him. And, boy, they walk around the door. There's... I, the house is packed and people standing in the doorway and outside the doorway they walk around to the windows and people are packed up to the window and standing outside the windows and they say, man, there's got to be some way. We've got our friend here. Our friend needs some help. The one that can help him is right in there. We've got to get this, this friend to him. And they find a way. They get up on the roof and as Jesus sits there in the middle of that house teaching them, they begin to pull up the tiling on that roof and they create a hole in this man's house and they let him down with ropes what faith and when he saw their faith the verse says verse 20 faith real faith will motivate us to action 
this faith motivated them. It would not allow the obstacles to stop them. That faith would not allow the circumstances to keep them from Christ. And the first thing Jesus says is, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Well, wait a minute, Lord. That's not why we brought him here. We brought him because he's a palsied man, and the Lord's going to heal him uh, uh, there in just a minute. But he says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. You know, in general, we desire the external to be fixed. We don't want God messing with the internal to us. We want our illness removed. We want our circumstances changed. We want those around us to change their behavior. Oh, preacher, if my husband would just change this, we'd be all right. Oh, if my wife would just change this, we'd be all right. In every case, though, it's the inner man that is the one that needs the first look. Jesus, the first thing he does, he deals with that man's soul before he deals with his body. Hey, sometimes we get so bent out of shape because of circumstances and trials and problems and uh, battles we're facing in our life, and we think if, if we could just straighten those people out. I hear people, I, I have pastor friends, and I'll hear them talking uh, sometimes about their congregation, and boy, I tell you what, our church would be doing a lot better if these people would just do such, such and such. I learned a long time ago. Ain't nothing I can do with y'all. I had a friend one time said, uh, how's your church doing? We began talking. And usually when they ask that, they what they really mean is, how many did you have? I said to him, I said, look, um, I figured out there's, there's somebody in our church. I, I figured out who it is that's causing the most problems. I said, they're, they're stunting our church growth. This one person is hindering our church growth. I said, you figured out who it was? I said, yeah. I said, well, who is it? I said, me. I said, I'm the problem. You know what? I have a good congregation of people here. Y'all are some good people. You tolerate me, and I appreciate it. Everybody needs help. Nobody's arrived, right? But you know what? There's not a thing I can do to change Brother Barry. There's not a thing I can do to change. If he has any faults, I can't change them. Look, look, watch this. I, I can't help him at all. I'm... Grows. Nothing grew. You know, I, the only one I can deal with and I keep my hands full just dealing with it? It's Ronnie White. Boy, I daily, I have to go to the Lord as a pastor, as a husband, as a daddy, as a, just a man in general, and say, okay, Lord, I need you to fix me. Lord, search me, try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lord, I want to be like Christ so bad. I want to be like your son, Lord, but that's not how I'm giving myself to you. Let me ask you a few questions here in conclusion. Number one, do we allow Jesus to be not only our Savior, but Lord in our life? Do you give him that place of authority? Do I seek his glory over my pleasure, or do I seek his will over my own will? How about this, do I live by faith? Oh, yeah, preacher, I live by faith. No, 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 not just a, a token word of faith. I'm talking that faith that moves us to action. Do I live by that faith that does not allow circumstances to hinder our pursuit of Christ? Do I live by faith that allows the Holy Spirit to change me from the inside out? Am I giving Him that place of authority in my life? Look, ask yourself that question. Not only is He your Savior, but are you allowing Him to be that authority in your life? Preacher, it'd be, it'd be a whole lot easier if everything else was straight. No, no, no. Are you allowing him to be that authority in your life? And are you living by faith, just simply saying, okay, you are Lord. So I'm coming to you. And any circumstances you want to change or not change, I'm trusting you. And whatever you do, Lord, you're still my Lord. Is that our heart's desire as we try to become more like Christ? 
I just had to close your eyes. Father, 